So let me now welcome Manuela uh, Campanelli, Dr. Campanelli, who will speak about her work on astrophysics. Uh, since this is not just any computing meeting, it's supercomputing, uh, Dr. Campanelli will uh, speak to us not just about any kinds of black holes, but supermassive black holes, right? So um, she is currently the professor uh, of mathematics and, and astrophysics at Rochester uh, Institute of Technology. She also directs the Center for Computational Relativity and Gravitation, sponsored by NASA and NSF. And uh, she has a distinguished career in general relativity, black holes, mag magnetohydrodynamics, gravitational waves, including being part of the LIGO collaboration. Is that right? Uh, she's no, her noted discoveries are associated with innovations in numerical simulation and computational modeling. And in fact, in 2005, she was the lead author of a paper that produced a, a breakthrough on binary black hole simulations. She's received many awards, and one of her articles was recently highlighted by the American Physical Society as one of the landmark papers of the century on the subject of general relativity. So her talk is entitled, Revealing the Hidden, Uni Hidden Universe, Supercomputing Simulations of Black Hole Mergers. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. So my talk will be on binary black holes. So you will hear um, a little bit of astrophysics today. And as I promised, uh, uh, um, the person who invited me, I will also talk a little bit about the numerics and the uh, supercomputing aspects uh, of the problem. But let's start with the astrophysics. Uh, well, we do have evidence today that black holes exist in the universe. It's not really like that that we see them. Really, what we need to do in order to observe black holes is either by looking at the interactions of black holes with other uh, compact objects, such, for example, black holes or neutron stars, or um, by looking at the electromagnetic emissions uh, that comes from the high, highly relativistic gas that is funneled down to the black hole. So black holes uh, are a solution of a uh, brilliant theory of gravity, which uh, is celebrating um, this month exactly 100 years from its first form formulation. Um, this, um, I, this is our, the few, among the few, only few equations I put is the most compact version of the equation of general relativity. Um, and they do relate, what they do is that they do relate uh, uh, how space time and mother energy um, are interrelated with them. Mothers, for example, tell space how to curve and space uh, uh, tells mother how to move. Now, this theory has been very successful. It has passed more than 100 years of tests uh, from the solar system uh, tests, uh, which were done at the beginning of the, the century, and then um, to uh, the orbital decay of the binary pulsar that led to a Nobel Prize. Now, if you all have a cell phone, you probably use a GPS, don't you? Well, if you use a GPS, you are actually using uh, the theory of general relativity because it predicts that time as well as, well as space gets stretched by the gravitational field. So time is running differently, whether it's running here on Earth or up there on the GPS satellite. Okay, so you're using this. Um, however, gravity is still weak enough uh, in, the, in the solar system, and in order to probe uh, this theory of general relativity in the strong field regime, we have to go close to the most compact object there are in the universe, and those are black holes. So black holes indeed exist in the universe. Um, there are various types of black holes, and we do classify them in general uh, based on their masses. Uh, so when, uh, for example, very large stars, stars that are uh, at least 20, ma 20 more massive than our own sun, uh, run out of their fuel, co they collapse under the force of gravity, and they do form a black hole. Those are the so-called stellar mass black holes, okay, because they are closely related to the masses of the stars. Um, like in this picture, uh, oops, I'm sorry. Um, above, um, we see uh, 
uh, for example, an X-ray binary, Cygnus X1. It is, we think that there is a black hole that is basically uh, driving the, the gas from the companion down to its doom. Uh, then there are the black holes at the centers of galaxy. In the uh, picture below on the left, you see the center of our own galaxy. And on the small uh, enhanced uh, figure is actually the orbits of the stars around the center of our own galaxy. Okay, from the, from the motion, relativistic motion of these stars, we can infer that there is a very massive black holes at the center of our own galaxy. And so there are also other black holes that we see in other galaxies like ours, and um, they run uh, from millions to 10 billion solar masses. So they're extremely massive. Uh, and uh, so the, the interesting thing about these supermassive black holes, and that's how we call it in our field, is that they are related, it seems to be related to uh, the history, the birth and history of the galaxy uh, itself. And um, how do they grow? How do they get so big? Well, they grow by swallowing other stars and by swallowing other black holes and by swallowing the gas that is um, around the galactic center. Okay, so the fact is that black holes can come in pair uh, because uh, we see that galaxies do collide during the history of, of the universe uh, most times. And for example, uh, when these galaxies collide, then eventually their center, their central black hole collide. And um, during this collision, there is a huge explosion of gravitational radiation. And we're gonna tell, gonna tell you in a moment what that means. But uh, this is such a powerful event that in just a few moments, if we could convert all that energy in luminosity, electromagnetic luminosity, it will outshine the entire universe. So it's extremely powerful. Of course, within galaxies themselves, you uh, will, uh, there are also smaller black holes that are merging those solar mass, stellar mass size black holes that I was telling you among themselves, also generating gravitational waves. Now, there's not only black holes, uh, other objects uh, in the universe also create these um, phenomenal explosions. Um, and some of those are, um, for example, neutron stars, stars that are very compact, uh, then when they collide, they also uh, generate very powerful bursts of gravitational radiation as well as supernovae explosion. Um, these are also accompanied by very powerful bursts of electromagnetic radiation, neutrinos, um, which makes them uh, really an, an ideal laboratory for understanding matter electromagnetism in the most uh, extreme condition of gravity. So black holes, though, are the ideal source because they are the strongest uh, sources of gravitational waves. Now, this is maybe a little bit uh, 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 complicated to explain, but the takeaway from this slide is that these black holes are actually uh, the ideal candidate for many of the gravitational wave detectors that astronomers have built. Uh, we go from the stellar mass size black holes that are the subject of investigation of the LIGO detector, which just started taking data, uh, and to the largest black holes down here, okay? And um, the only thing that changes here is the frequency, obviously, uh, and that depends on the mass of the black hole. So these objects are really the holy grail of astronomy because they are all over the places. Okay, so looking for LIGO, uh, for gravitational waves with LIGO, uh, LIGO, as you know, is a, is, which stands for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, is one, uh, is one of the uh, uh, current gravitational, currently working gravitational detectors. It is taking data right now as we speak it started just a few weeks ago, and uh, it, it, it is exciting because we may be able to see for the first time uh, uh, in the next few years uh, the direct collisions of binary black hole coalescence. It includes, uh, this collaboration is very large, it includes a number of scientists, uh, 
more than 700 and run over 50 institutions. It was funded by the National Science Foundation and for nearly now almost a billion dollars. Okay, so, but what are these gravitational waves, right? So gravitational waves are actually ripples of the space and time. And what they do, okay, so imagine that you have uh, a black hole binary uh, that emits gravitational waves toward us. And coming over to the screen of my slide here, what it will do is the following. It will start stretching and compressing my little Einstein this way, okay? It will stretch and compress. But this stretch and compress is very, very, very tiny um, when it reaches Earth. So much that the LIGO instrument, uh, which is shown here, which has these two very long arms, so that when gravitational waves come through, one gets compressed, one gets stretched, compressed, stretched, right? So uh, the LIGO instrument can measure these tiny, very tiny changes, okay, um, due to the passage, to the passage of, the, of the gravitational wave, which is actually, it's actually measuring distances that are smaller thousand times smaller than the size, the radius of a proton. So this is a really amazing experiment. Uh, this is equivalent to measuring, actually, the distance of Proxima Centauri, which is 4.3 light years away, to a precision of 10 microns. OK, so but, um, in order to actually um, um, understand how to detect these gravitational waves, we actually need to model them. And this is why we need supercomputers. Now, this is not something new. This actually was already envisioned in the 60s here, actually 1957. So I found this note by Charlie Misner, which I think is very interesting. He was already predicting at that time that computer machine, better than anything we have now, and many programmers and a lot of money would be needed to solve this problem. Okay? And then, funny, the note later on, either the programmer will shoot himself or the machine will blow up. Okay? Because indeed, this is what happens for many years because it's been a really daunting task to solve these very complex equations. We're talking about 10 partial nonlinear equations couple, all coupled together. Um, so it's not an easy system. So it took uh, a lot of effort worldwide. And uh, so I'm not going to be justice here to the entire uh, astrophysics community by making references because there are hundreds of papers in this, in this field. But let me just uh, walk you through the main the main, I think, salient um, point in history, especially the ones that concern supercomputers. So in the 70s, in the 70s um, we actually owe our uh, uh, success to the pioneering efforts of Larry Smarr uh, and Epley, who did the first simulations, the very first simulation of binary black hole at the supercomputing uh, lab at Livermore. Okay, and then later NCSC. Later on, uh, this was picked up by a large effort called the Grand Challenge and uh, by groups, very large group, for example, the group run by Edward Seidel, who is sitting here in front of me. <laughs> and uh, so and we did, were able to make major advances to the field. Um, because it, it requires really, as um, the vision in Misner say, a lot of effort and a lot of programmers and a lot of money to solve these equations. Um, but at that point here at the end of the two, year 2000, we almost lost faith that we could make it. So famous physicist Kip Thorne at Caltech declared that I have bad that these numerical activists that gravitational waves will be detected from black hole collision before their computation are sophisticated enough to simulate them. Was that true? I think not. Um, we did indeed uh, solve the problem 10 years ago. Uh, these are the two first papers uh, and one of the papers that was mentioned here, um, where these equations were solved in a manner that we were able to evolve stably these black holes for long enough to extract the gravitational waves. So the difficulties were really uh, uh, 
uh, come, they were really uh, due to, not only to the mathematics, because the Angersville's equations are very complex. Uh, as I said, there are 10 nonlinear partial differential equations in general really cannot be solved analytically. You need supercomputers for that. And also, uh, they, they change character depending on the choice of the variable ascending the gauge, right? So uh, not easy to find your uh, preferred numerical algorithm to integrate these equations. Uh, and not only that, they have physical single, there are physical singularity because we have black holes. Um, and so we have to use a particular coordinate system that kind of avoid, either avoid the black holes or, um, you know, are capable of not get stretched uh, the, so that the grid points close the black hole don't get stretched too much. Because remember, this is a black hole. So it will start, you know, uh, you know, not only eating gas and, uh, and other objects, but also your computational grid points. So you have to really be clever how to do that, okay? So um, these simulations uh, nowadays, uh, they are evolved forward in time in 3D, of course. Time, uh, we all uh, use the method of line integration uh, in and for uh, uh, the for time, we advance also in this three step, we use a runge integrator. So uh, these are codes, and you see here a simulation of an extreme mass ratio uh, binary, which is very challenging. Uh, they do need uh, to use a higher order finite differencing uh, in order to get to the key uh, resolution um, to be able to resolve what is going on close to the black hole. Um, we have uh, developed advanced numerical algorithm now today uh, that these advanced, the advanced uh, algorithms are, of course, very complex. They have, <laughs> you know, thousands and thousands lines of codes, but uh, they do scale very well now in supercomputers. For example, here I have the Einstein toolkit, which is a computational toolkit which has been developed by the uh, uh, international community, which is very successful and it's public. So if you want to start working in this field, now you have, you have this complex code that we've been working for so many years uh, being public. And of course, with all the, uh, with all the uh, um, tutorials that, that you need in order to be able to use them. Okay, all of these are based on a code called the uh, Cactus Code, or Cactus Computational Toolkit. And they also use adaptive mesh refinement, as I see, I've shown here in this, in this simulation here, uh, which is uh, the Carpet Code. Okay, so in order to, uh, to do these simulations, we need to use uh, supercomputers uh, of thousands of processors. Uh, and, oops, <laughs> they warned me not to use the, okay, so our vanilla simulation, for example, uh, used tens of millions of individual time steps and tens of terabytes online RAM, and this increased really dramatically whenever you increase the masses of black holes or the, or the how fast they are retaining, just because it requires more and more resolution there to actually uh, resolve the physics of the black holes, okay? Uh, okay, so the next slide went on. Um, and here uh, in this slide, uh, I'm showing the, some of the most important uh, results in the field. Uh, so what we found, for example, is that when these black holes collide, as you say, a lot of these um, gravitational waves get emitted up to almost more actually than 10% of their mass, their initial mass gets radiated away in these gravitational waves. Um, the, this radiation is so intense that the final black hole can get even ejected from the whole structure, for example, the galaxy. And that's happening because these waves carry energy, okay? So as the waves get emitted in a non-isotropic way, because the, maybe the black hole have different masses or they're spinning, uh, they impart a kick to the final black hole and they can, that can get ejected from the galaxy. So uh, 
This is uh, some of the most modern uh, simulation that we can do nowadays. Uh, hope this is playing. It should have some music, but okay. So not playing uh, the music. But you will see uh, uh, the black holes here and the little arrows indicating the, how fast they are spinning and how the direction of the spin changed during the simulation and the gravitational radiation that is produced during this collision. Uh, the thing about this particular simulation is that it's very long. Uh, and uh, so nowadays, we can actually do them um, because, uh, again, the availability of the computer resources. Um, and in order to discover, for example, this effect of the spin flip, flip flop, the spin change in direction, uh, we needed really to have these very uh, long simulations. Okay, so we couldn't do it with short simulations. Um, okay, so what really gravitational waves from black hole look like? What you see here, for example, is a typical gravitational wave signal. That's what you saw in the previous movie. And the thing that I want you to take away here is that these gravitational waves are waveforms are important because they do contain information about the binary. They do contain information about the masses of the black hole, the spin, the orbital parameter, and so on. So you will see different um, shapes of these gravitational waves depending on the characteristic of the binary. Uh, and in general, we have an eight-dimensional parameter space to explore in this case. So um, we have to therefore do many of these simulations. And in order for LIGO to know what to look for, it does have to have many of these long waveform calculated. Okay. Um, so there is another source I have no time here to speak uh, uh, and to make a fair, fair uh, job at telling you about uh, the physics that goes in here, but this is the collisions on neutron stars. Um, these are also very, leave um, behind also very uh, powerful gravitational waves. And in addition, uh, in the last few seconds before when the neutron star collide and they form the black hole, there is an accretion disk that survived. Um, and that accretion disk um, release uh, and during the merger and during the post-merger, there will be a release of a powerful burst of gamma and X-ray that we see uh, um, we, we detect, uh, astrono astronomers detect uh, nowadays, okay? Okay, so when matter is present surrounding a binary black hole system, uh, like in the case, for example, supermassive black holes, um, what, what happens is that not only you have the gravitational waves that are emitted because of the collisions of the black holes themselves, but the motion of the gas surrounding the system is highly relativistic and therefore uh, can emit electromagnetic radiation, okay, in the optical and the radios, in all a whole spectrum. Uh, and the thing is that there are other astronomical observatories that are uh, there to detect this electromagnetic uh, radiation emitted from these systems. So now, the ideal situation for an astronomer like me is to be able to combine the observations of gravitational waves with the observation of electromagnetic uh, emissions from this system, because then you can learn a lot about the system. And this is uh, a new field called the field is a field that we call multi-messenger astronomy, which is just emerging. Okay, so what do you need to do to model these black holes when they are immersed in a very gaseous environment? Okay, so you need uh, very uh, accurate simulations because you have uh, to uh, resolve the physics close to the black holes, but also the source temporal variability and energy spectrum. Um, of the electromagnetic uh, uh, emission. And then you, you have a very complex problem because in the case of the supermassive black holes, you start from, you know, kiloparsecs, tens of kiloparsecs separated, and a parsec, I remind you, is 3.6 light, light years, okay? So um, you have uh, 3.26 uh, light years. And so uh, you have these very far separated systems um, 
uh, as I say, at the order of kiloparsec, going down to uh, astronomical unit when they do merge. So this is an amazing problem to solve computationally. It's unfeasible, even with all the supercomputers uh, we have now on the planet. So in order to do this problem, we have to split the problems in uh, different um, physical scenarios and then try to connect what we learn uh, from one scenario to another, okay? Um, so for, the, for this, for describing this problem, we need to do magnetohydrodynamics uh, and we need to be able to resolve the magnetodynamic turbulence, okay? Um, and angle and momentum transport. Uh, we need 3D because, first of all, nature is in 3D. It's not in 2D. Uh, but uh, also, there is no turbulence no, in 2D, for example, okay? So we need gravity, and uh, in the last stages, we need to solve the Einstein's field equations. Uh, we need some interest in physics, um, the re hopefully relativistic, uh, uh, very re realistic thermodynamics, you know. And then we, we need also uh, radiation feedback. Okay. So uh, these, uh, so there have been simulations, of course, about this problem. And uh, the most recent 3D simulations clearly find very different results from the earlier 2D simulations. For example, in the case of the black hole binary and the accretion disk around it, uh, in the 2D case, there was relatively little gas that was falling close to the black holes because what you, what you have is the binary tidal torque pushing the gas far away. There is no magnetodynamics to drive accretion, so very little gas in the region of interest. And that's where you want to go. You want to go close to the black holes to make the strongest electromagnetic signals, okay? So you need, therefore, uh, to simulate this in, with magnetodynamic in 3D, okay? And the picture changes in the last, and this is very recent, this is actually, you look 2008, 2009 to now, this is really very recent changes that because you're able now to do these simulations in 3D in full MHD, we can see that accretion continues through uh, the merger until pretty, pretty much close, the black holes are close to merger at, uh, up to the point where the disk, the gas cannot follow anymore, the very, very like, relativistic merger, okay? But that's very up to the very, very far, uh, final moments. And so there is gas that falls into the region close to the black holes. And that is essential for um, finding electromagnetic signatures. Okay, so this is some work that we did to confirm exact this. What we do find is um, interesting results out of these MHD simulations. Um, mothers uh, falls in into the region close to the black holes. It does this uh, everywhere, but especially into very dense streams that we're going to see streams that goes to the black holes and from the black holes. And interesting, there is also an overdensity that develops in the larger disk. And whenever this uh, streams, very dense streams, hit this over density, there is an emission of, of, of uh, electromagnetic signals, okay? So uh, really, to do these simulations, we, uh, to understand though what happens very close to the black holes, we need to put the black holes on the grid. Uh, in this case, to save computational uh, resources, we had cut out the regions of the black hole, so we couldn't really fo follow what happens close to the black hole, okay? Very close to the black hole. So we are changing this. Oh, and um, let me say that there are um, also other simulations, uh, a lot of exploratory work that is done now in trying to solve uh, the Einstein's equation in magneto with magneto coupled to man magnetodynamic to find out what happens at the very last moment, okay? 
but these simulations unfortunately are too expensive even nowadays to be carried on for hundreds of orbits. And we need these hundreds of orbits in order to study what happens in the accretion disk, okay? Uh, and um, so in the GR simulation, for example, the Caron condition is set by the speed of light, while in the uh, magnetodynamic simulation, it is set by the speed of sound, okay? So, uh, so this is why the simulations are really uh, expensive. Um, so we need really a more efficient framework to simulate magnetodynamic accretion into black holes. Um, to efficiently run it for hundreds of orbits. Okay, so we, we do this uh, using a particular model. Uh, the code that we're using for this simulation is called HAM3D, which is a fine, uh, volume finite difference in code uh, that solves the MHD equation in a dynamical curved space time where the black holes reside. Okay, so. Um, and then with the black holes, we have to use a little bit of finesse here because if you do not want to solve the GR equation numerically to save uh, precious resources and enable to do these hundreds of orbits, then in this case, we have to uh, use uh, cleverness and um, use, for example, um, um, ways to approximate the space time in the regions where the expansions of the Einstein's equation are valid, like in this model here. Uh, this is highly technical, so I'm not gonna explain exactly what happens here, but we do this, um, uh, we do provide a solution, okay, of the Einstein's fields equation in the regime uh, where the binary is spiral for a long, long time around each other, the black holes spiral for a long time around each other. And we do this uh, analytically, so we don't have to solve the Einstein's equation in this case, because remember, we have to do hundreds of orbits. Okay, so, uh, but <laughs> even with that, it's not, it's not uh, enough, uh, because once you have the black holes on your grid, Everything is dictated by your black holes. Basically, half of the points of our simulation really reside near the black holes. So we have to work uh, in, uh, uh, again, being clever on how we use our numerics close to the black holes. Um, and in this case, for this simulation we're doing, we're doing it in two ways. Um, one way is to use this uh, warped grids. So this is uh, some kind of fisheye in both, uh, in some, in fisheye that enhance uh, the grid, so concentrate grid points close to the, close to the black hole. So it's, uh, your grid is no more uh, even in this case. Okay, and the nice thing is that far away, this uh, will uh, asymptote the spherical polar coordinates, while in the vicinity of the black holes, you have the Cartesian coordinate, which are better to resolve what's going on in these regions. And then you also ha have to develop, uh, you know, um, what is uh, called a multi-patch uh, framework, where you can actually um, put high-resolution re uh, high grids in the regions of interest, for example, on top of the black holes, okay? Okay, so this is a simulation showing what's going on with this warped grid, for example. Of a, uh, this is a binary black hole going on for uh, a few orbits. Um, and what you can see is that you have uh, these uh, streams of matter that goes from the black holes to the larger disk and vice versa. And every time that these hits the the larger disk, there is uh, electromagnetic signal coming out. Um, and on the left, you see the uh, warped grids in action and how they really adapt to the motion of the black hole. Now, I haven't plotted all the grids there, it's only, only 20, 20 of them because it would be too busy <laughs> for the movie, okay? All right. So this is the emerging picture from these simulations. Um, so 
again, we have the larger second binary disk that surround the binary system. And um, then gas tends to fall in driven by MHD accretion, okay? It falls in uh, on, almost everywhere, as you can see in the enhanced uh, picture, but mainly through these streams, dense streams of matter. So now this is the, uh, dan the log scale of the density. Um, I, don't, I, I don't have for you the, um, a plot that would show you the luminosity, but you would see in a luminosity plot really that the most hot figure, uh, features are either close to the black holes or in these streams. Okay, and every time these streams now hit uh, the inner edge of this uh, larger disk, there is a signature. Now, we have to do this uh, using MHD. This is just a test run that we have done on uh, the blue water system uh, in full MHD. Again, uh, um, note the, the <laughs> SUs that we had to use for this, but it didn't run long enough, in this case, yet to form the mini disk. So what happens is the gas falls in close to the black holes, through the streams, pile up around the black holes and form this mini disk, okay? And then eventually, this, the binary as it is spiraled down, what should happen is that this mini disk uh, will collide uh, uh, and among themselves and will create powerful shocks uh, that will also emit gravitation, uh, 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 sorry, electromagnetic radiation. So the, these signals that you expect is not only from the streams, uh, dense streams coming from the black holes hitting the large disk and vice versa, but also from the final moments where the black holes getting together and the, the mini disks start touching each other. Okay. So we're talking about very highly relativistic gas here. Okay, so uh, in order to do the simulations, we use a petascale application improving, improvement discovery uh, grant. So, um, and we, uh, we also uh, so have had a petascale resource uh, allocation uh, grant from the NSF to run these, uh, these simulations on the blow water system. It seems to change, to change without me hitting. Uh, but just to give you an idea, our vanilla GRMHD simulations, they do require 10 to the 7 cells, evaluated approximately 10 to the 7 time steps. It keeps changing. Somebody wants to finish the talk for me. <laughs> um, and uh, we're using more or less 4,000 4, 4, cores uh, right now on blue water to do this, okay? And now with the, uh, it seems that it's, it's keeping changing it for me. So let me finish, so before we change the next slide, but in order to do the simulations with uh, the warp degree, the multi-patch, and uh, the more, uh, the more uh, complex simulation, we need at least 10 times more of these resources. Okay, so I have to conclude. <laughs> so we have uh, made some amazing predictions about the physics and astrophysics of binary black holes and other complex objects in the last decade. Uh, large astronomical observatory are just taking data nowadays, so we expect, you know, um, we are on the verge of imminent discoveries, an uh, important discovery in this field. And to reap the benefit of, uh, of all these observations, uh, we need to be able to uh, simulate this uh, binary black holes with and without gas uh, using the larger supercomputer available, okay? And petascale super supercomputer resources for academic research are really the key to model this very challenging system. So, Next, well, we want to find out the true answer to all the questions of the universe. <laughs> Thank you.
So uh, we do have time for questions, a uh, few questions. Um, and in fact, uh, while I was listening, and uh, I did receive some on the, the app, so I can immediately start with uh, one question from a, a viewer. And it says, you showed a simulation of uh, black holes colliding. How fast do they approach? That is, what distance did they cover in those two to three seconds? OK. So the answer to this depends on the masses of the black holes. OK. So if we're talking about uh, supermassive black holes uh, in the last portion of the merger, in the collisions, OK, that portion will take from weeks to days, depending on how massive it is, OK? So if we're talking instead uh, about, um, um, for example, stellar mass black holes, then those um, we're talking about milliseconds. OK. Question? Are the gra uh, gravitational wave detectors being built directional so they can tell where the wave is coming from? Or if not, how do they distinguish the signals from the entire universe to tie to one of these simulations? That's a good question. Uh, so the gravitational wave detectors are not being, they are not directional, okay? So they, they can explore, they explore a vast region of the space, but they cannot find where or where to pinpoint the source, at least if you have only one detector. But if you have multiple detectors, you can do something like a triangulation and trying to find the location of the source. Another way you can try to find the location of the source is actually combining, um, if you have, for example, uh, a merger of a neutron stars instead of a black hole, then you know that will be electromagnetic signature coming in, so by combining the electromagnetic signature and the gravitational wave signature. So if you observe a gravitational wave and you know it's coming from a neutron star system because you have done your good job of modeling accurately this system, then, then you can talk to our friends, astronomers, uh, that looks at gamma ray bursts, for example, and see whether they do find gamma ray bursts around the same. So we'll have uh, one, one more quick question, and we'll move uh, on to the next speaker. So you showed a, uh, you mentioned that the supermassive black holes can be ejected from the galaxy. Is there observational evidence for this? And I guess, is there observational evidence for the ejection of supermassive black holes? Or likewise, is there observational ev evidence for the spin flip of, uh, you know, perhaps your angular momentum of your galaxy is opposite of the angular momentum of the black hole? Okay, so this is another very, very interesting question. Okay, so astronomy ha concerning the gravitational wave kick or recoil, the ejection from the galaxies, there have been various observations that look like uh, spectral lines, for example, of the uh, accretion disk that surround the system. Um, and uh, looking at um, you know, at these lines, they can determine whether uh, black holes can um, can get a, are ejected from the system or not. So now, those unfortunately though are very um, primitive kind of interpretation because they are very indirect. There may be other ways, uh, other reasons for, for example, uh, creating the same observational signature. Uh, the only way really that you can uh, detect. Uh, a binary black hole merger and a recall would be through its gravitational wave emission. And that we haven't yet. Uh, we are just working on it right now. Um, you know, the gravitational wave detectors are taking data right now. And so if there is such a system or a black hole merger, which is expected to produce a kick, we wouldn't know. And then, again, we could eventually uh, look for it. Obviously, uh, in the cases of the kick that I, I, I've shown, I was talking about the supermassive black holes. Those are not the target for, for the LIGO, from the LIGO detector, okay? Um, nevertheless, every black hole that collide and has unequal masses and different spins will eventually generate a kick. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Campanelli. Thank you.